So we're going to talk today about what happens when uh, the members of Congress perhaps lack the uh, constitutive virtues necessary to fulfill their proper function and how that deforms the constitutional order, um, also known as the administrative state. So um, before we really get into the details here, uh, I'm Russ Green and I'm on the panel um, with, uh, we've got Kent Lastman, uh, Philip Howard, and David Frum. I'm not going to go into their bios. I'm going to presume that you already have access to that information. Um, but let's start by just simply defining the administrative state. What is it? Is it a group of agencies? Is it some legal structure? Is it something else? So let's go down the line and perhaps we have different definitions um, for each individual. Okay. Um, well, well, I'll start with a uh, a minor correction, and I think that's going to give us all permission to argue a little bit. I don't think we have an administrative state. We have a regulatory state. And that regulatory state is one of three ways. It's a complex system that the government extracts resources from our lives and from the economy. We tax and spend, we borrow and spend, and we regulate. Altogether, uh, it's about 30 31% of the size of what we're taxing, right, and borrowing. $6.2 trillion budget, that's what we know about. Well, more than $1.9 trillion a year is the low-end estimate of regulatory costs. So the regulatory state is a way to regulate, and regulation ha is a cognate. It means one of two things in English. It is either to make orderly, like we regulated the queue for the uh, caffeine out there, for the coffee and the tea, through social norms. You just get in line behind the next guy. It also means to control. And I think that's most of what we're talking about today. And so I would just correct and say these 460 plus agencies that have rulemaking power, many of which have adjudicatory power, the, p the power to find you guilty of something, that is a way to control the economy. And it is a way to control the economy when there are um, failures in the legislative branch, when there are, by design, interest in hiding away activity. And so it's a uh, fairly pernicious aspect of the way our government works. I'll stop there. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have a different take than my friend Kent. Um, uh, you know, the, in theory, the administrative state or regulatory state is just intended to, to execute the operating systems of government, to enforce laws, all that kind of stuff. As a practical matter, what's happened is that uh, it's become a lawmaking body as well as an executive body, um, and Chevron's up the Supreme Court, so there are lots of arguments about that. My problem with it uh, as it's grown is it's more or less literally out of control, not only of Congress, but of the president. And this has two, two pernicious aspects. One is, particularly on the lawmaking side of the administrative state, but also in execution, is uh, in our constitutional system, it has become practically impossible to amend or repeal <coughs> both laws and, and, and regulations. And so what we have uh, uh, is basically democracy by dead people. So you have these, uh, these, these rules that were, that were written by somebody long gone in the 60s or 70s or 80s, you know, and, and as well as statutes, you know, the Jones Act in 1920 or David, which no one can all have special interests in favor of, which no one can get rid of. So, so we have this system of obsolete laws, 150 or something like that, job training programs, none of which work, that nobody can get rid of. So, and there's no leadership solution to this, because it's too big, and it's too, it's, it's like sediment in the harbor that's, that's risen up all these years. So there needs to be a narrative about the need for basically a super BRAC commission that proposes not to get rid of government, not the Tea Party, but just to kind of make sense of it and stop wasting uh, I, I did an analysis once that said you could save a trillion dollars just by 
fixing or getting rid of 10 programs that everybody knows is broken. Everybody knows it's broken. I mean, there's not, not anything there's any serious debate over. So, so, so we need that narrative. The second problem with, with the quote, administrative state, so that's the kind of legal framing of it, which is all this obsolescence, basically. The second but is that the operating machinery is out of government. I've written a book, which some of you picked up, called Not Accountable, arguing that the, um, that, that, that the civil service system and the, and, and the political um, and, and the requirement of collective bargaining, I think, is clearly unconstitutional. You know, we elect, um, I'll just stick with the president, a president who doesn't have the authority to, to fire executive employees who don't do their jobs. And it's not just the president who doesn't have this authority, and <coughs> it's, it's, it's the people, you know, we think the enemy are the bureaucrats. Well, the enemy are not the bureaucrats. The, actually, the people we rely upon are the senior civil servants. They don't have the authority. They're the ones whose authority is really broken. You can put a massive, so one of the reasons I don't like Schedule F is it assumes this idea that you can have many more political appointees. It assumes you can put a bunch of political appointees on top of the map. Okay, fine. And so, so in any event, you know, I think that executive power, um, you have to make government so that it's operational. And that requires rebuilding sort of change of authority and checks and balances and other things that people can trust and, and make it work again. So you have administrative state that's governed by laws which are obsolete and is more or less completely unmanageable because of union controls and because of the of the kind of micromanagement that's inherited in the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978 and similar statutes. Um, wh whether, or not we ha whether or not we have an administrative state, we clearly have administrative law. And we are about to have a huge, we are on the, on the verge of a huge expansion of administrative law, um, weeks away. Uh, it looks like there's a, going to be a big bipartisan deal on aid to Israel, Ukraine, uh, Indo-Pacific, and the border. And the, and the border portion is going to include hiring... Ten. What? 10,000 bureaucrats on the border. Yeah, ten, and, 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 and judges. Asylum judges. And asylum judges. Right. Um, and uh, because uh, we have backed ourselves into a situation where um, we have created this vast universe of asylum claims, every one of which has to be adjudicated. Everyone, every person who lives in a country where there's violence against women um, or pervasive physical insecurity, and that's most of the world, has, has at least um, a facial claim to an asylum in the United States, and you're going to have to adjudicate it. Uh, and we already have thousands of Social Security judges, and the places where most Americans and now most of the world will meet the United States government with a light, but maybe for each person, a life and death matter is in front of a, a non-Article Three judge. Um, and once you start thinking about that, I don't know that there is a way out. I mean, how do you decide whether your back pain uh, is disabling to the point where you get a Social Security pension or not? Um, there's no way to automate that. There's no way to make that a matter of statute law. Somebody's going to have to decide. And how does somebody decide whether the level of violence in your village back where you came from is personal enough to you uh, that you have an asylum claim? Um, I think, so the, the, this goes to, to something you said the, in the very opening remarks. A lot of these, uh, a lot of these um, administrative requir requirements are in the nature of the things, but many of them are in the nature, are, arise from defects of Congress. Because uh, the reason we have a border crisis is basically the United States passed laws and entered into international treaties that were designed to make sure that when the Anne Frank family left Germany, they had a place to go to. And that uh, a, a system of asylum imagined for highly specific cases of individual persecution has bequeathed a, reg a regime that leads to this vast possibility for much of the world to move to a what is clearly a better place to live. I'm no criticism of anybody who wants to come to a better place of live. We all trace it back to someone who made that decision for themselves. We, we can have compassion and understanding, but on the other hand, it has to be adjudicated, and that involves, as you say, thousands of new administrative law judges. So we're, at the be we're not at the, in the middle of the story, we're at the beginning of the next big chapter of the story. And if we think there are problems with how the story is working, we have, this is a chance to say, in advance, with this new bill coming, how do you make sure that administrative law meets the constitutional ideals of the American system? Great, um, so that's where we are now. 
Um, let's talk a little bit now about a better state or perhaps the ideal state. How should uh, the federal government be working? Um, and I think David sort of hinted at this a little bit, you know, with his reference to the Constitution and also Article 3. That's Article 3 of the Constitution, um, which uh, uh, gives authority to um, federal courts as opposed to administrative adjudication. So um, let's start with Kent again. And, you know, what, what, what's the ideal state here, you know, setting aside, for example, you know, our present situation? And, and David, sorry, could you pass the, yeah, the mic down? Yeah. Well, the ideal state, it, um, it sounds silly, but it's worth getting on the table, uh, does not mean no regulation, right? Um, the, the ideal state is for Congress to legislate and for the executive branch to implement these laws. And these laws have to be sufficiently clear and narrow, usually, uh, that allows for implementation without uh, too much uh, discretion, and that that phrase there, too much, is really important. That's the line drawing exercise. That's the exercise that Congress has avoided for uh, two generations. That's the exercise that our courts find presented to them. Where do we draw the line on discretion? Um, I would submit that we don't need uh, an eleven and a half billion dollar EPA, right? They're doing things there uh, with a police force, with a uh, specialist in toxicity, with uh, thousands of lawyers, a handful of economists that are essentially legislative in purpose. And that is replicated all over the government. So um, we, we keep track of something called the unconstitutionality index. And this is a, it's a simple ratio uh, most of these things are not, in fact, unconstitutional. And Kent, that's, that's you at CEI? This is at the Competitive in, uh, Enterprise Institute. But it's the ratio of uh, major rules adopted to laws passed by Congress. In the last decade, it's 22 to 1. Right? We, d we do not have uh, three branches of government with blended powers right now. Say that again. It's, ratio of what? it's the ratio of major rules from regulatory agencies in the federal government to laws passed by Congress. In the last 10 years, it's 22 to 1. Um, so basically, they're legislating. Well, they're legislating. As David says, they're adjudicating. They're, uh, and oftentimes, they're, they're taking over or claiming authority that uh, is clearly prohibited. Uh, and I'm, here, I'm thinking of self-funding agencies, right? The Constitution's pretty clear. Uh, if you want to raise money in the United States for the government, for that purpose, a bill must originate in the House, it must be bicameral, and it has, faces the test of presentment. It has to go to the president. Most agen m Many agencies and most of the independent agencies do not do this. They raise funds on their own. Um, and, and that's allowed by Congress looking away and Congress saying, well, we're, we're, we're going to set that up so that we don't have to worry about the FCC or the... SEC or the or the whatever whatever whatever. Or the consumer finance. That's the, that's the, one that the CFPP most recently. Yeah, that's the most, extreme case. Uh, most recently, it has a blank check to draw on the Federal Reserve. The Consumer uh, Finance Protection uh, Bureau board. Yes. So some 15 years ago, uh, Professor Warren dreamed up this idea. We now are stuck with it. Um, I don't want to take up all the time, but I, I do think it's important to put on the table that the the ideal is not a regulation-free life. It is a constitutional government that can be managed, as Philip talks about, in a way that is limited. We have to put limits on these agencies. To, so to summarize, I, ideally, the lawmakers make the laws, judges adjudicate, and the executive <clears throat> branch executes. Ideally, that's not what's happening now. Philip. Yeah, I think there's a conflict in ideologies that uh, conservatives have suffered from for years, which is the idea that you can, you can uh, restrict the state by making um, laws and regulations very precise, and therefore you limit the discretion of, of, of executive employees. And I, I understand that, except what it results in is 
4,000 rules in OSHA. And it results in this, this, these, these literally, literally thousand page rule books that are, that are micromanaging everything so that actually, so the regulation like OSHA is basically counterproductive. They, they could put more, most of those rules, probably 3,000 of them could be subsumed within one principle. Tools and equipment shall be reasonably suited for the use intended in accord with industry standards. That would do away with 3,000 rules. And it requires a measure, you know, it allows a measure of interpretation by the inspector or whatever, but people kind of know, you know, what's, you know, you could use an industrial grade hammer when you're building a house, but you could use a dime store hammer when you're tacking pictures on the wall. You know, you, you use your judgment. So it's a, um, so we have this state that's designed um, ostensibly to reduce uh, uh, discretion by officials or power, but in fact, uh, shackles society so that all these services don't work because everybody's buried with their noses in the rule books and not getting anything done. I mean, Australia years ago, they got, they, they had a thousand page rule book for nursing homes, which are terrible. They're terrible in this country. They're normally regulated with thousand page rule books to tell you how often people get their meals, how many peas are on the plate. I mean, it's just unbelievable how many feet the bed is from the window. You know, the same with, same with uh, nursery schools. I mean, it's just unbelievable how micromanagement is. In Australia, they got rid of all the rules. They replaced them with 31 general principles, have a home-like setting, respect the dignity of the residents, that kind of stuff. The experts said these nursing homes are going to give away with murder. Within a year, the nursing homes were twice as good. And they went and studied it. Why was it? It wasn't because the, the government gave up its authority. It had fuzzier authority. So there was more room for disagreement, and they had oversight, and courts could oversee it and all of that. But what happened is that people went started going through the day they could internalize what was required. You wanted to have a, a nice nursing home. They focused on what the residents needed. So it, it's, it, you know, is it, so we have this system that, that smothers people in detail that no human could possibly keep track of. You couldn't possibly have any, any uh, subsidiarity devolution to community organizations. They can never comply. You know, it's just completely anti-human. And, um, is, is one of the problems with the state. We need to dejudicialize management. We do need judicial control over uh, in, interference with private parties doing their work and stuff. But you don't need judicial control over fairness of personnel decisions. You can have a check and a balance. You can have somebody say, well, is this unfair? You have a workers' council, which Toyota and other companies have, you know, in their factories. But but making everything into a hearing, and you know, I don't know how you deal with immigration because David says it's really a hard problem, but judicializing every one of these hundreds of thousands of people, literally we'll be here for, for three millennia. We, you, you know, you can't, you, you, you know, the, 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 the judicial process can't work for mass events. It just doesn't work. You have to actually have an authority mechanism. So. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, thanks, and, and, thanks, and have accountability. Yeah. So. yeah. So, so, David, could you speak to the uh, ideal state in, in your vision, as, um, but particularly as applies to that issue that you yeah. raised, the Im immigration issue? So, you, you all know the story of the um, two quarreling business partners who come to the rabbi for advice. And one lays out his grievance, and the rabbi hears it and says, You're right. And the second quarreling business partner says, Wait a minute, and tells his story. And the rabbi ponders and says, You're right, too. And the first one says, we can't both be right. And the rabbi thinks very hard and says, you're right about that as well. <laughs> so you just heard, the question of fairness, you just heard it right there. Because as proposition A, you know, a state where bureaucrats can do whatever they want without any law and not even answering to the president and just making, up, making it up as they go along, that's, that's illiberal, that's tyrannical, uh, that puts all of us at the mercy of anybody with a rule book. And Philip says, okay, says Philip. Um, but if we do it your way, now we have written thousands, millions of detailed rules that res result in everything being judicialized and everybody being miserable and nothing happened. And I think you would both say to the other, you're right. You're right. <laughs> and, and so I think to the question of what is the ideal, 
Another quotation, Sigmund Freud famously said that the, the task of psychotherapy was to convert crippling neurosis into ordinary unhappiness. Um, <laughs> that we're not trying to get to an ideal state. We're trying to uh, manage two imperatives, each of which I think we cherish. One is we want to live in a world of clearly defined rules adopted in legitimate ways and with a minimum of bureaucratic discretion. But we also don't want b the people who have responsibility for important public functions to be so tangled with the code book. We've all seen this scene in the movies that you know that the uh, the, the torpedo is heading to the toward the destroyer and the captain is leafing through the navy regulations for <laughs> <laughs> assistance on what to do. We don't want that either. Um, and and where we, when we move from actual administrative agencies into administrative law, this becomes the problem becomes very acute because how do you know whether this per who that the law says if you're too sick to work or too disabled to work, you don't have to work. Well, what does that mean in practice? Uh, who's going to decide that? The person who's claiming the pension? Obviously not. Um, some statute? Can't write the statute. There's got to be a, a man or woman mm -hmm. uh, at a desk listening to somebody and his doctor or her doctor uh, detailing the symptoms and saying, you know, you can work. You could work. You could do something. Or no, you can't. You get a pension. And the same way with, I mean, every, there are two million people crossing the border a year. Every one of them says it would be better for me in the United States than it was at home. And each of them is paid between ten and fifty thousand dollars to get here. So clearly they are strongly of the view that it would be better for them to be in the United States than it would be to be at home or they wouldn't have paid all of the, that money which is from their point of view a very serious <coughs> price. On the other hand the United States says wait a minute you've got fifty thousand dollars to spend to get here. It can't be so terrible for you back home uh, at least in many cases. So and that is going to come to an adjudication. And that adjudication, it's pretty hard to des de describe rules and regulations to do it. So I think the answer to your question, what is the ideal state, is we, we have to understand that we've got a conflict of goods here. And, we, and our goal is to optimize each of them, to have um, clear rules adopted in legitimate ways um, with, that are executed by people with clear lines of authority that ultimately can be appealed to the voters. So the voters can say, you know, President Gomez, we don't like the way you're running the government. We want President Robinson instead to run the government a different way. And when we choose one or the other, we get different results. Because I think one of the things that uh, drives people crazy about modern democracy is you vote and the things you really care about in your life don't change because they're subject to rules that are not actually up for, right. up for the vote. Um, uh, we want that to be true, but we also want to yeah, have sure. we also want to have government that works in a way that they don't say yes to every pension claim or every asylum claim, but they don't reject them all either, and somebody has to make those decisions. Great. Uh, Kent, I think, has a comment quickly. I just want to expand on, on this point, because what David's saying is extremely important and informed by decades of work that Philip has done, right? So we have a regulatory system that is, by its nature, anywhere you go in the world, if you have a regulatory system, it tends to be inflexible. Rules are rigid, is what David has been describing. They're, they're black or they're white, and someone has to interpret them. It's rigid, it's inflexible, it's slow to be adopted, it's even slower to be changed, usually it's not changed. These characteristics have lent itself so that we have a system that is sclerotic, that it's stuck, it can't be adapted. And one of the most important features of uh, the suboptimal best case scenario that we can get to, not the ideal, but the best case that we might get to, is that we want regulatory systems and a regulatory state that can be learning, that can be adaptive, that can make room not just for innovation in the economy, so that different people can learn how to run schools or run nursing homes different ways, but that different agencies can learn how to set standards differently and, and set benchmarks and implement yeah. yeah, let me just briefly, uh, I, I think we have two problems, and I, and I do think you have to separate them as two problems. We, we have the problem of public goals. We never get rid of old priorities. It's, it's an accretive state, and it's wasting, pick a number, a couple of trillion dollars a year in doing stuff or doing it in a certain way that makes no sense whether it's procurement guidelines or red tape in health care or any, all of that stuff serves no public good. It serves no partisan good. It's just wasteful. And so we need to change, we need to clean out the government's goals, not in a Tea Party sense, but just in a pragmatic sense. 
The second problem, which, which I think you and David are more focused on, is, is execution. I'm just about to publish an essay on authority and freedom. If the people running institutions don't have the authority to enforce the values of that institution and applying things and be accountable for how they do, and this is in government as well as in universities and schools, nothing will happen sensibly. Everything will get bogged down in argument and judicialization. So, so the, the whole relationship between authority and freedom and what the range is of discretion. So it's not about getting rid of discretion. It's about creating the boundaries and accountability mechanisms that contain it. And that's going to be different in every area. It's going to be different in immigration than from, you know, from worker safety or others. Right. You're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, and we, we focus here, obviously, because we're in Washington on the federal system. Um, but, of course, this all applies at the states and it applies with an even more vengeance. I'm sure many of you saw the story about the French company that was hired to build the California high-speed rail system. And can, France has, you know, is cutting edge railway technology and California is building this system that I, I used to know how much it cost. I've stopped counting because it's just, my, I, my, my I guess my internal brain calculator can't do numbers that big. Uh, and, and the company finally, the French company finally said, that's it, we're out of here. Yeah. We can't deal with this. We're, we're going to go build a high speed, literally in Morocco, yeah. <laughs> where things can get done. Right, and, it's, and you, you drive through the Central Valley it's like you're going by the remains of the aqueduct in Rome. You know? yeah. <laughs> there, are these, there are these giant things going on for miles, and they go, they connect to nothing on one end or on the other yeah. end. I, I think the French company said there was less corruption in Morocco than in California <laughs> as well. That's what no, I recall. No, 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 actually, it, it, the tragedy is the real tragedy is, of course, there's less anti-corruption in Morocco. I am sure that yes. I am sure that that no one to, uh, in the California system took. There maybe someone took an illegal lunch, right. and maybe somebody took an illegal thousand dollars, but certainly no one took an illegal hundred thousand dollars. Not enough graft. Uh, the, uh, but but they just they, it's, it's all environmental impact studies and uh, rights of way, and and uh, studies upon studies, and then the cost of money, and the money was all spent honestly. It's just there isn't a train at the end of it because because everybody has read uh, Robert Caro's book on Robert Moses and said, okay, we have to stop this from ever happening again in this country. And we have. <laughs> yeah. the, but what about the stakeholders? Yeah. I'll be taking um, the purple line. <laughs> so, so I think we have a good understanding now of the problem. But you know, perhaps so that um, we give the audience some hope, let's start talking about potential, I don't want to say solutions, but, but measures to move towards um, a more effective and accountable government. So uh, Kent, any ideas? Well, again, I want to start with a, a big point, a big picture point. Um, there is a really uh, dangerous uh, idea that permeates Capitol Hill, and it's comfortable in Washington. Uh, it makes it quite uncomfortable in state capitals. Uh, it makes it quite uncomfortable for those of us that want to see reform. It's this idea that more independence for these agencies is a good thing. And there was a reference earlier to Senator Warren and CFPB. But then the, the logic goes like this. We want to take agencies and insulate them from the, the whims of political behavior. So we don't want political control. Uh, we, we want them just to do expert work, technical work, technocratic work. And that runs square into a cherished value of democratic accountability. So that idea needs to be set aside, and I think there's hope because there are uh, glimmers of light. Uh, just this year, this calendar year, um, ideas like a BRAC-style commission, the, the mid-1990s base realignment uh, commission that was uh, essentially a tool to change the decision rule for how Congress would shut down military bases after the Cold War, instead of having an up or down vote on a base in a particular district, they decided to have an expert commission recommend dozens, and they would vote on all of them at once. So that it was a collective exercise. We could do that for agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, I would rather do it for agencies than rules, but we could do it for rules as well. Uh, and that sort of idea, there are 12 rules, or 12 pieces of legislation that have been introduced and moved through part of the process just this year 
that deal with regulatory reform. Two of them received unanimous votes in committee, 29 and 41 members of the House. That's both parties. They said, we've, we've had enough. We have to do something different with how we regulate. So I, I what are those bills? Oh, Russ. <laughs> uh, one was in judiciary and one was in small business, and I'm not going to give you the acronyms because I just don't know them. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, well, presumably the audience has access to Google. I can get them yeah. to you, and I'm going to uh, hastily move the microphone down because yeah. this man has a command of statistics yeah. and, and, and detail. And, and, and Philip, in answering this question, could you touch on the Schedule F issue as yeah, well? Um, yeah. yeah, so so the first point is uh, is new leadership is, is not what is needed here. I mean, we need new leadership, but it's not close to being sufficient. We need a new idea, uh, and it's an idea of system overhaul. I'm working with a documentary filmmaker on a podcast series called It's the System Stupid that goes through every area that talks about how structurally, you know, we keep, structurally we're, we, we guarantee waste, we guarantee failure. And so here you have a society that's in the, the, the you know, why do all these people support Trump? And it's because they hate the system. They, they, they hate being smothered. They hate being told what to say. They hate, there's this resentment. I grew up in Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. They hate the system. They hate Washington, you know, and, and they're right to hate it because it's talking down to them all the time. So, so you need something that actually addresses that problem, and neither party will do it because neither par both parties are invested in different ways in the status quo. Washington will not lead it because it is the engine of the status quo. So this would require an outside movement. It requires a smart columnist like David Fromm to lead it, to about why we need something from the outside. So, so it, the good news is that people are actually now thinking about, like for, for example, how you run government. So, so Russ says, well, what about special schedule F? So as a result, in part of a paper that I wrote on the unconstitutionality of civil service, Trump did the Schedule F, which is increasing, converting senior civil servants, a couple thousand of them, to political appointees. Therefore, they'd be more subject to being fired if they, if they basically practice the what, what the we be wig, we, we'll be here when you're gone, just ignoring executive orders and stuff. And there is this problem of the bureaucracy just not going along with the political will. So I understood that. And it was, and I think I'm partially blamed for it. I actually don't think. Or to credit. What? Or, or credit, to credit. Or credit. I actually am opposed to Schedule F and for, and for something much bigger because I don't think you can put political appointees on top of a mass of red tape of the civil service system that's unaccountable and make anything work. And so the people in the middle of civil service, the senior executive civil service, uh, the service, th th those kinds of people, they don't have authority over their employees because of collective bargaining agreements, other, any decision they make, who sits at what desk in an office has to be negotiated under the collective bargaining agreement. It is crazy. I mean, it's crazy how little authority people, and you can't, 99% of all uh, public employees get a fully successful rating because if you put one thing in the file like, shows up to work late or doesn't cooperate well with employees, you have to prove it in a grievance proceeding. Well, nobody has time for that. So you, we, we, we've judicialized, in effect, every little choice. And so people now realize the system is broken and there's a tension to it. And the good news is, I think it's possible, perhaps in this election cycle, to start having a really robust debate about and discussion and vision of well, how should civil service be run? It shouldn't just be, I believe in the merit system. I don't believe in just firing people because you don't like them. So what are the speed bumps that are not hearings? You know, how do you attract good people to government? All these things, I have a, if anybody's interested, I have a one page outline of my vision for how civil service ought to be redone. It's quite radical, but sensible. If you want it, I'll give me your email and I'll send it to you. I think Philip may be persuading me that I should change my career and become a civil service employee. But um, David, any, any uh, thoughts about concrete steps? Uh, so I want to dissent from one thing Philip just said, although I, I, which I always do with trepidation, <clears throat> and that is this is really not the, the, the electoral cycle 
with, with, uh, for federal reform. Because the problem with the Schedule F idea in the current context is uh, it's proposed, uh, whatever its merits or demerits, and its opponents say, wait a minute, you're only doing this so you can make a military coup. And the answer is yes, well, I do want to make a military coup, but that's not why I'm proposing this particular uh, piece of legislation. So I think you need to get past the current cycle. I think we're all anti-coup on this panel. Yeah. But, but yeah. Um, I would say from, from the way you do this in a way that is dr dramatic is, is, and touches people's lives is especially the level of the state of California. Um, and what, what, what this country needs almost more than anything is a Republican Party of California that says our goal is to build a million homes a year. That's our goal in the state of California. That's what we are, we're about. And to build the, everything that those homes require. Uh, trains, planes, automobiles. We, that, that's, and, that's what and all that other stuff that you hear from across the Mississippi, that's got nothing to do with this party in California. We are the million homes a year party, or 100,000, I don't know what the number is. Um, and the what, conservatives in Canada are doing this, right? right and it's working. Right, this yeah. is Pierre, Pierre Poilever, the leader of the conservative party, tried a number of kind of wacky themes, anti-COVID, and he's finally hit on, Canada takes half a million immigrants a year, or near 400,000 immigrants a year. Nearly all of them settle in the greater Toronto area, and it's extremely difficult to build houses in Toronto. So what's supposed to happen? when you bring 400,000 new people into your into basically one metropolitan every year and don't allow people to build and th that's going to be parallel pull ever session we need Toronto needs 400,000 or not everyone needs their own home but needs hundreds of thousands of new homes a year what are the obstacles to building let's eliminate them one by one and then once we have the home then the home needs a sidewalk and the sidewalk needs a road and the road needs a tramway and the tramway needs an airport and everything and electricity and everything else that follows. What are the obstacles? And in the United States, those obstacles are especially state and local, not federal. And California is ground because that California is the future of America always. It should be the most dynamic state. It's yielded that uh, crown a little bit to Texas, but it's still this is where the future is made. Why can't they build? And that is the, that is the thing to identify. And it may, it may not be one big answer. Maybe the reason you can't build houses is different from the reasons you can't build rail. But once you're committed to building the houses, then everything else follows. Because you have houses, they want roads. The people in those houses, and they are voters. So that's, that's I think, the, the point of the spear, is getting, uh, getting houses built and then getting everything the houses need built after. Yeah, great, great point. And one thing I'll, I'll briefly note on uh, Canadian conservatives is that they become increasingly popular among young people, actually, because it turns out that young people want to own homes. Yeah, believe it or not. So um, we, I, I know Kent had something to say, but we only have seven minutes left. So I'd like to go to the audience for a question or two, if possible. Uh, yes. So FreeOp was, uh, was founded on the notion that there were 60 vote veins you could find 60 senator vote veins you could find and while you know a law that says that every agent you know all these laws are created in a crisis of the moment and then we're still stuck with them living on the couch as a 50 year old you know using the remote Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all these things that had a moment in time and now they're still hanging around the couch and I'm sure that our border apparatus will be hanging around on the couch overweight so conservatives would love to put sort of death dates on all these things, but I don't sense a lot of 60 vote energy for that. One thing I've noticed amongst my Biden administration friends, now they come to Washington and they're in charge of the deputy undersecretary, they, they would love to be able to fire just a few people. Just give me the chance. You know, in my company, I had 5,500 people. I fired more people, according to the USA Today annual column of all the federal agency people, you know, than all of the federal government, it seemed, you know. And I wasn't a butcher. I just, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out, you know. Joe's a little slow, whatever. <laughs> is, there, uh, is there anything inside the delivery system that you guys see that are 60-vote moves? Or is there, in fact... A chance to, I mean, you're saying screw the votes, I'm going to the courts, and I love that, and good luck. But are there 60 vote plays just inside the machine uh, or, or, or outside that, that you, can you tell us about the 60 voteness of them? Great question. Uh, uh, Kent, you have thoughts? Well, there's, um, I, I forget which one of these gentlemen raised the point, but there's, there's something really instructive, and in this is a dark way to get to a good place. <laughs> Um, 
<laughs> the last 25 years, we've lived through uh, three significant crises. Crises of government, crises for this country. 9-11, a financial crisis less than a decade later, and the effects of a global pandemic and COVID. We have, I, I had not considered the crises that David put on the table in the coming months with the border and asylum seekers. Uh, we have a crisis in view, right? And it has to do with debt, entitlements, and inflation. P pick your accounting method, you're four to six years away. So contra what David said, a little bit more aligned with, with uh, Philip on this, uh, I think there's an opportunity for leadership to say, we are gonna take these radical steps and the implementation date is either three years from now or five years from now. And a, uh, accepting one person who's on the political playing field right now, uh, I think there are many credible Democrats and Republicans who could make that claim and garner uh, roughly 20% of the opposition party to support it, to say, I'll go with you on that. We have a 50-50 Senate roughly. They could get 10 senators from the other party to say, I'll do these radical things as long as I know they're not being implemented entirely on your watch. And I have a shot at, at implementing them myself, or my, my team does. I just say, you know, I agree with that. But Tocqueville once said that there's an amazing power to the force of public opinion. Um, if you want to get 60 votes, you have to turn public opinion. And right now, there's no public opinion driving system overhaul, whether it's how you run government or anything else. And so, uh, uh, you know, I'm out beating my head against the wall of my whole life, so beating my head against the wall. The, uh, uh, is um, talking to presidential candidates, talking to potential third party candidates, and spent the evening last week with Mitch Daniels talking about these things, desperately trying to find somebody or bodies that can congeal behind the narrative of system overhaul, because until you get that narrative and the senators feel pressure that they have to fix these systems, they're going to go with their interest groups, and it's worked for them so far. Well, and, and my point is only, uh, you, as broken as they are and as bad as they are, according to uh, Governor Sununu, um, they do respond in crisis, right? So there will be a response. So we need to give them an alternative. As they respond in crises in the next five years, the alternative has to be radical overhaul. And that radical overhaul, I submit, can attract at least 20% of the other party. How can you say that the current immigration is not a crisis? Everybody sees it, right? I, I'm not claiming that it's not a crisis. Uh, I just had not considered the, the, administrative, the administration of judicial claims. I just hadn't thought of it. Let's give David a chance to talk about his 60-vote uh, solutions. Well, I think home building is, at the state level, a 60-vote solution. Uh, yeah. Why can't I build a house? Because one of the things to remember about houses is, it, um, and this is a, a thing we tend to forget, is houses come off, the house, houses fall down. Houses, so it's not like it, that if you build a million homes, you have a million plus. You have, there's a certain amount of housing stock that either collapses or is demolished or is in the wrong place. I mean, you have, you have no, if you want a house in Scranton, you have your pick. But Scranton used to be a, a city at the cutting edge of important industries, but that's not where the job, Scranton is with respect to the president, not where the jobs of tomorrow are being created. So the housing stock of Scranton doesn't help and it tends to become dilapidated. Um, so housing is a 60 vote issue. I think we're going to have, um, there are some potential here. One of the things that has been a great constraint on the growth of the federal government has been technology. I mean, think about how many people you would need to run the social security system with the technology of 1972 and how, um, how computers have replaced almost everything that everybody does in the social security system. Um, is there ever going to be a time when um, social security disability claims could be adjudicated by artificial intelligence? Um, plug in the symptoms. Um, I, I bet that, well, we just know that, that the artificial intelligence will eventually do a better job than at least half the judges. <laughs> <laughs> and can, are, are, there, are there technological solutions that can expedite it? So people, by the way, this means that people with good claims get heard the same day. 
I mean, that, that could be a problem. Same day adjudication, speed it up. Because with asylum, the claim adjudication takes years. And for the people who have good claims, I know people who, are, who have really good claims who've been in the system for 11 years with, without able to, with, they're free to stay, but they can't ever go to Europe because they don't have a passport. Well, I think that's a, that's a good note to end on the optimism about technological change and also about bipartisan solutions such as with housing. Um, so thanks for your time, everyone. Um, appreciate it.